day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are often oblivious to God's near presence, consumed by our own interests and unable rightly to see and trust others. Our God is merciful, eager to forgive, seeking us out and able to transform. Confident in this character of God, be bold as we confess our sins together and then in silence. God of grace and mercy, you have called us to fill lives filled with grace, mercy, and you have called us to minister to the least of these. You have reminded us that when we embrace the hungry, the thirsty, the strangers among us, when we care for the sick, clothe the naked, and visit those in prison, that we are serving you how easy it is to get so wrapped up in our own lives and needs 
that we neither see nor minister to those who called us to serve. We are often unaware that we have failed you. Forgive us once again and open our eyes and hearts to love and serve you faithfully each day. <clears throat> Friends, God has raised Jesus from the grave and has promised us new life and forgiveness in him. Today, let us celebrate the grace and goodness of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. Now, as I tell the children, let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I know that we do not have any children necessarily present with us. Um, but let us not forget that we are all children of God. And hopefully this morning, as their parents may be watching, um, I would like to share with you what I was going to share with them. Some of you may know this already, and that's okay, because we can all have a lot of practice in this. Uh, during the season of Thanksgiving, and given all that's been going on in our crazy world, we can't forget to keep our prayers strong, to keep going, um, to give thanks in the midst of everything. And so one of the things that I wanted to teach them, that I will now teach you, is um, a hand prayer. How many of you know what a hand prayer is? Oh, good. This is going to be great. <laughs> if you will just ball your hand very, very lightly, not a fist, like you're angry, but just very lightly. And um, your thumb, you can repeat after me. I love you, God. And your pointer finger, I'm sorry, God. Your middle finger, thank you, God. Ring finger, help others, God. Your pinky, help me, God. And then we lift the palm of our heart to God, and we bring it into our heart. Amen. Let's do it again. <laughs> I love you, God. I'm sorry, God. Thank you, God. Help others, God. Help me, God. Amen. Thank you very much. Our first reading from Scripture on this morning is from the prophet Ezekiel, 34th chapter, verses 11 through 16. Hear God's word. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep 
I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading from Scripture on this morning and the one primary to this morning's message is from Matthew's Gospel, 25th chapter beginning at verse 31. The final of several passages in Matthew's Gospel that have to do with things at the end, in the culmination of time and in the fullness of history, what will things be like? It was a question asked by early believers in the early church, and it is a question that is asked by us as well. What will things be like when the Son of Man comes? Hear God's Word. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, 
and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the angels will, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our Lord will stand forever. Right off the bat this morning, I should probably issue a disclaimer and admit that this scripture depicting Christ's final judgment is one that has always bothered me just a little bit, but likely not for the reason that you may be thinking. The reason that I'm not too cozy with this scripture is that I am left-handed. And on behalf of South Paul's Everywhere, I want to wave a banner of victimization because it is plainly stated here that the sheep are placed at Christ's right hand, the hand of His favor, while it's the goats who are made to stand at His left hand, the hand of condemnation. Of course, this expresses the ancient and perhaps not so ancient notion that the left is the side of wickedness and the right is the side of goodness. And we, South Paul's bristle just a little bit by our association with the left side of things, with the evil side of the ledger. It is worth noting that the Latin word for left is sinis, S-I-N-I-S, from which the English word sinister is derived. You may not have known that. Many of us have heard stories, and I suspect, I suspect that some of our older members can even remember a time when school teachers, elementary school teachers, punished their students for using their left hand as they were learning how to write. Many people of past generations were literally forced to learn how to write with their right hands, even though their instinct was to use their left hand. I will admit to having some amount of satisfaction back in 1992. You all may recall that at that time we had, in that general election, there were three presidential candidates. There was an independent candidate by the name of Ross Perot, and there was George H.W. Bush, Bush Sr., and there was Bill Clinton, and all three of those guys were left-handed. How about that? And so you can see that my bias against a scripture which insinuates that my left-handedness places me on the side of evil and, and God's disfavor is one that I, I struggle with just a little bit. So with that little bit of venting aside, thank you for letting me share. 
I would also want to say that this passage of Scripture is truly one of the most transcendent statements of hope and justice that exist anywhere in all of the Gospel writings. Here, in this passage of Scripture that I just read, we find a depiction of final judgment with Christ enthroned as a sort of shepherd king, if you will. On this final Sunday of the liturgical church year, I cannot think of any more appropriate Scripture for our consideration than this one. To begin with, we see Christ here not as the kind of king that the world normally sees. Even with our historic American bias against royalty of any kind, we can only marvel at what is implied by the return of Jesus Christ sent from heaven to reign among us and to usher in the promised kingdom of God. What a wonderful era. What a wonderful time this is to be. This is not a moment, you see, for the faithful people of God to dread or to fear. It is a moment of fulfillment. A moment of culmination when all things are made new and the sheep of God's pasture are claimed by God as God's own. This is that moment at the end of the movie when the good guys finally win the battle that they have been waging against all those forces of evil since the opening credits of the movie ran. It is a scripture and a vision that should bring us joy and not sorrow. It should bring us hope and not despair if we are to be found numbered among the faithful people of God. The scene of a shepherd separating sheep from goats is one that most of us may find alien. Again, I'm a city boy. I don't know about all these kinds of things, but it is one I am told that the people of Jesus' time would have found to be quite a familiar image. They would have been well aware of the fact that during the day, lots of people owned sheep and goats. They didn't just have one or the other. And often the sheep and the goats were allowed to commingle. They were allowed to graze out in the open field in the same pasture. They mingled freely with each other and they fed from the same land during the day. But as evening fell, the sheep and the goats were separated from one another, largely because I am told that goats are a little bit more susceptible to the cold at night. And it does get cold at night in the Middle East. A lot of people think that it doesn't, but it does get cold at night. And, and goats are rather prone to getting cold. Sheep with all the thick fur that they have are less prone to that. And I'm also told that goats are, are much more restless creatures and that their behavior at night can be upsetting to, to sheep if they're all kept together in the same pen at night. They're much more restless. And so this image of sheep and goats being separated from one another was quite a commonplace uh, sort of scene depicted in, in ancient Palestine. And my understanding is that... The, Things are still much the same even today among shepherds in that part of the world. Of course, the Scripture takes us to a far, far deeper matter than the simple necessity of keeping goats warm and sheep contented at night. The separation spoken of in the final judgment is one based upon other criteria. And the sheep and goats taken together are to be seen as the people from all the nations of the world. I think that that's the image, the, the, the comparison that, that's really being made. In bestowing praise upon the sheep, the shepherd king affirms that when he was hungry, they fed him. When he was sick, they took care of him and so forth. In short, when he had needs of body and spirit, they offered him some form of ministry to, uh, to meet his needs. The startling thing about all of this is that they really seemed to have no clue as to what they were doing. They couldn't remember feeding him or giving him shelter or any of the things that he cited to them that they had done. When was it, Lord, that we did these things that you say that we've done? But the response back from Christ is that whenever they did these things for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, the least of these, they had done so to him as well. The initial response of surprise from the sheep, I think, betrays their pure intention. They'd simply been doing the things that compassion and mercy requires that they do, that we do. They weren't trying to accumulate divine merit badges. 
They weren't trying to be seen among their friends and neighbors as more righteous somehow than other people. Rather, they were simply living out of their Christ-centered lives and doing the work of mercy and compassion that is so needed in our world. And as they engaged in these activities, they were serving the needs of Christ, even though they apparently had no idea that they were doing such a thing. The judgment of the goats is just the opposite. They had refrained from acts of mercy and compassion. They had not fed Christ or offered Him shelter or taken care of Him when He was sick because they had failed to serve the least of these. Perhaps they had been absorbed by their own needs by proving their righteousness in all the public places. Maybe they were so busy praying inside the temple that they failed to see the needs of body and of spirit that existed outside the temple, outside in the streets. So they simply ignored the least of these, figuring that the plight of the poor and the needy were of little to no account. They thought that they had been living for God and they were surprised to hear that judgment had fallen upon them and numbered them among the goats at Christ's left hand. The story is told about the life of Martin of Tours, uh, an early saint of the church in the 4th century. He lived in Europe, uh, an early Christian. Martin of Tours was a Roman soldier, but he was also a Christian at a time when it became possible to be both of those things. In the 4th century, it was not illegal in, in a way that it had been just a hundred years or so before. The story is told that on a particular winter's day, Martin of Tours was entering a city when he was approached by a beggar at the city gate. Instead of just giving the man money that had been asked for, Martin tore his overcoat in two and he gave half of it to the poor beggar who was freezing cold. That same night, he had a dream in which he saw in his dream Jesus wearing half of a Roman soldier's overcoat. And in the dream, an angel asked Jesus why he was wearing that battered old coat. And Jesus answered the angel saying that my servant Martin gave it to me. Any thorough reading that we do of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry reveals the affinity that Jesus had with the poor and needy people of his world. I don't think that there can be any denying that. And if we ever begin to slide down that slippery slope of thinking that Jesus loves the rich more than the poor, if we ever begin to adhere to some form of prosperity gospel that is so widely preached in our time and place, then we need to check ourselves. Bad theology. It's not biblical. It's not so much that Jesus hates the rich and loves the poor instead, but rather that Jesus expects the rich to care for the poor from out of their abundance. As He said elsewhere, from everyone to whom much has been given, much is required. It's likely that, that more of us fall into the category of those to whom much has been given rather than into the category of the least of these. We may not be opulently wealthy, but very few of us, at least to my knowledge, very few of us lack the basic things that we need and a little bit more than that. Seems fitting somehow that not only is this Christ the King Sunday, but it's also the Sunday before Thanksgiving as noted earlier. We all know the stories surrounding the pilgrims and how the celebration of Thanksgiving came to be. We likely know that the, the first harvest for the pilgrims were not quite so bountiful as are sometimes imagined, as are portrayed sometimes in the storybooks of children and the like, but that the pilgrims felt it was necessary to give God thanks for what they did have and for the freedoms, in their case, religious freedoms, that they now enjoyed, that they hadn't before. Surely there's a lesson in that for us at those times when our harvest may seem a little less bountiful than it has at times in the past. 
Surely there is something that we can learn about what it means to be thankful and to trust in God no matter what life's circumstances may bring to us. The pilgrims, of course, were people who placed great value in simplicity, and they saw their simple gifts as gifts of lasting value and worth that could not be measured. But there's a silver lining, I suppose, in our present financial challenges as a congregation in this time of pandemic. Maybe it's along these lines. And maybe it will help us spiritually to cherish the, the richness of what we do have instead of lamenting over that which we don't. We might notice that much of what Jesus commends the sheep for doing unto the least of these and thus unto Him are things that really don't cost all that much. It doesn't cost that much to, to feed a hungry person, to give them something to drink. It doesn't cost us that much to provide shelter or care for the sick or provide a usable garment for someone to wear or welcome a stranger. It doesn't cost anything to do that. Our ability to do these things doesn't depend all that much on the balance of our bank account or the performance of our stock portfolio or anything like that. The only thing we really need to be numbered among the sheep is to find our lives centered in Jesus Christ, the Shepherd King. If our treasure is in Him, then our hearts will be also. And we cannot help but serve the needs of this world, of His world. It is in this way that Christ reigns in us and beckons us to see His face in the faces of those who are hungry, and thirsty, and sick, and strangers among us. So it must be said that good works alone are not enough to save us. It is not in the performance of good works, good deeds, that our faith begins. Rather, it is good works that flow out of us when we are one with Christ. It is out of commitment to serve Him that we serve others. And it is in that commitment to Christ our King that our faith journey really begins. So we serve not to accumulate merit badges or somehow prove ourselves worthy because we're all sinners in need of God's mercy and compassion. If it's about worthiness, we will never get there. Instead, we serve the world's needs because once we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ and find Him at the center of our lives and ruling over us in body, mind, and spirit, we cannot do otherwise. If Christ is our King, we will love the world with simple gifts of mercy and compassion that He has first shown to us with the love that comes to us as a gift that is freely given. For God so loved the world. Amen. Let us join together now in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord of our abundant harvest of things that we need and, and even sometimes things that we desire, we offer our gratitude to You in this week prior to our Thanksgiving celebration. Our gifts and life and our work and our friendship and our communion with You are simply too many to name, but we pray that we might receive faithfully and humbly what You bless us with and share with others as Christ would have us to do. We're thankful for the freedom to worship as we please in safety and for the gift of this wonderful church facility and especially of this sanctuary where we sit even now, this lovely house of worship that provides a place for us to sing your praises. We're so grateful for that. Help us not to take it for granted. We acknowledge the energies and the labors of those who walked before us here and who built this facility, who were led to do so by the Holy Spirit. 
May we who live and breathe now help it to continue its witness and to extend God's welcome as we gather and when we go each week. Lord of heaven and earth, we pray for the needs of our community and the world. Hear our prayers for those who are homeless and hungry, and for the ministries like Helping Hands and the Village Group of Thornwell, so many groups who do so much important work. We pray that they would be able to begin to meet those needs we hear spoken of in this morning's Scripture and help it to begin with us. Lord, we pray for soldiers and for sailors, for all military personnel who are in far away places this holiday season. We pray for their families that await word of their well-being or their arrival home. We pray for those who engage in counseling and caregiving ministries and those who need such things to mend their brokenness. We pray for parents raising their children to be in tune with your holy wisdom and for children and youth growing up in a world that offers many unholy influences and directions. We pray continuously for our schools, for our teachers and school administrators and for our children and their parents in this time of uh, difficult school situation. We pray for patience. Lord, we pray for citizens everywhere dealing with natural disaster and the, the rebuild afterward. We pray for families who grieve loss. We pray for those dealing with stressful situations in their place of work and those dealing with unemployment. We pray for those who will be traveling in the week ahead to be with friends or family over Thanksgiving where that may apply, though we know that those travels may be diminished in the current climate. We pray for our congregation as we continue to discern your will for us as a people related to our sense of mission and spiritual identity, related to the church activities and church life that we have known and hope to get back to at some point when it's safe to do it. We pray for the church of Jesus Christ in all places that its people might share Christ's love with joy, gratitude, loving our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who sows his peace deep within our hearts and harvests us for the heavenly kingdom. Pray in the name of Christ, the one who was the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who reigns forever and ever. Amen. I would invite you now to stand if you are able to do so. As we say together the words, the Apostles' Creed affirming our faith in Christ as His disciples. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us turn to God in prayer. Lord, on this day, we dedicate ourselves to You. Everything that we have and the people that we are, shape us now into the people who You intend for us to be. Lord, be with our congregation, be with our nation, be with our world in this time. Help us to be those who are faithful with those treasures that have been entrusted to us both today and every day. As we pray in the righteous and holy name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.